Feminism has always been here, even if it wasn't recognized as such. Women have defied convention since Sita crossed the Lakshmana Rekha and since Eve ate the apple. Um, I've really recently been hearing people say, well, there are women in power, there were women, women can do anything, women are in universities being clever all over the place, why do we need feminism? Um, if that's your view, please stay for this session and listen. Um, and I am also keen to point out that this is entitled Many Feminisms. And I'm aware that not all feminisms are represented on this panel. There will be Q&A, a sizable Q&A, and I'm especially welcoming of participation from young, marginalized, LGBTQ plus communities. So do bring your voices to this and, uh, and participate. Uh, we have a massively distinguished panel, bringing feminism from all around the globe, I'm delighted to say. Um, we have Claire Wright here from Australia. Claire is a professor of history and a professor of public understanding. Um, you described that as to me as political history with the women put back in. I'm totally here for that. And, and around your campaign work around statues and monuments, we'll be we'll be hearing about that. Marta has come from Norway. Um, she's a prolific writer and creator of graphic novels. They've been translated into 20 languages. Um, she works in schools and does a lot of work around exporting the, the Scandinavian equality model. And then someone who really needs no introduction is the mighty, the one and only, Ovashi Butalia, AKA my high priestess. Yeah, thank you. Ovashi is, I mean, where to start? Um, I just feel so lucky that you're in the world. I really do. Um, I she might co-founded. Exit it quite soon. Who no, knows? no, no, no. Wait, you will, you will hear the praise. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, everybody knows that she co-founded with Ritu Menon, um, Kali for Women. Um, I cannot overestimate the importance and the significance of those early feminist publishing houses that that changed the game for women's voices being amplified and. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, thanks to the women that did that. She now runs Zuban Books, which does fantastic work. Follow them on Insta, follow them on socials, get signed up to Zuban Books, is, um, to their mailing list, and just find out what they're writing about. Shout out for the Feminisms of Our Mothers, a current publication. Um, Ovashi also pioneered the telling of women's stories from partition, in a time when really those stories were not emerging. So. You have pioneered so many things, and we're very grateful that you're here, having done about 20 events today. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you each in turn, starting with you, Avashi, to share with the audience one feature of your work that is currently most pressing. Thanks, B. Uh, great to be here, at Claire and Marta and you. Thank you for that great introduction. So I'm not sure that I can actually um, easily identify one feature but I shall um, identify one plus one. The plus one is not my work, but I do want to say this, that if all of you look at the chairs we are sitting on, you will see patriarchy at work because these chairs are designed for men's bodies. So watch what happens when I sit comfortably in this chair to a woman of my height. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> So next time you look at these things or a microphone or whatever, you know, just think about patriarchy works in very subtle ways. Um, in my work, so I'm a publisher mainly. I publish books on and by and about women. And uh, I come from a fairly privileged uh, class, not upper caste fortunately, but fairly privileged class um, of person in uh, India and I publish in English. So for us as publishers, the most important thing that has been um, really something we have wanted to do in the past is to look at feminism in India as more than just what is articulated by women like me, as something that actually belongs in all over this country, in its villages, among the most marginalized of people, and the question, the most pressing question is, how do we bring their voices to public attention? And it's not a simple question of just making a choice and publishing, say, a Dalit writer, or a queer writer, or a trans writer, but it is also a question of working with readers, with audiences, and 
you know, bringing to the attention of audiences that when you're looking at different literatures that come from the margins, you have to read differently. You have to think differently. You have to throw that canon out of your head. And it's also working in a market that is hostile to a bibliodiverse universe to make that market hospitable and amenable to bibliodiversity in the deepest ways, because that is really what will change the way we think of knowledge, and that will change the nature of knowledge, and that will make us understand the importance of living in a world with diversity. So for me, that is the most pressing thing right now. Thank you. Same question to you, Marta. Uh, yeah, well, um, <laughs> hello, everyone. I'm uh, very, very happy to take part of this event and being in India for the first time. As you've already heard, I'm a Norwegian nonfiction author. Uh, and my most read book is this one uh, called Women in Battle, which is a uh, graphic novel about the women's liberation movement. Yeah. Is yeah. it available to buy afterwards? I, uh, hope, hopefully. <laughs> Good, and, check uh, it out, there'll be signings. And I know the, the follow-up uh, book, which is called Smash the Patriarchy, it is here. <laughs> so, um, well, um, I've been traveling a lot because it's been out in so many countries. Uh, I've been visiting like lands like Turkey and Egypt and uh, Brazil and Russia. And uh, in many of these countries, the situation for women and for gender equality uh, is quite different from what I'm used to in uh, Norway. Uh, and in very many areas, I experienced that the word feminism is controversial in itself. Um, and uh, I meet uh, people, uh, or active women, who, activists who are who feel stigmatized in their homeland because of this, and because there are still so many prejudices against feminism. Uh, I find it strange, uh, but they are still out there. That feminists are, you know, uh, bitter or ugly or man haters and so on. Um, and uh, uh, so. Um, uh, people ask me sometimes, uh, what does the word feminism really m means? What, what is it? Uh, people feel, today I was visiting a, a What a do you school. say when they, when they ask you? Yeah, uh, well, it, today I was visiting a school and there were some young Indian boys who, uh, who believed that, uh, that feminism is a gender struggle, that there is a fight between uh, boys and girls and that one side is to win, you know, and the other is to lose. And I said that that is, of course, totally wrong. Uh, freedom is not a cake where <laughs> that we should, should share and more to you means less for me, uh, no, absolutely not. Um, the, the, uh, the feminism is simply a word for the fight against uh, sexism. That it's, it's as simple as that. If you're a feminist, you do not want gender to limit people's uh, opportunities or freedom in life. And I often uh, compare it to anti-racism because it's uh, quite the same. Uh, if you work with anti-racism, you do not want uh, uh, co skin color or ethnicity to limit people's freedom or opportunities in life. And these are resistance movements and they have a lot in common because the core of sexism, the core of racism, the core of fascism and homophobia, it is the same. It means that someone at some point has to, uh, decided that we are the norm in society and uh, you, you are something else. And because we are so different, there has to be some rules for you and some rules for us. And that's the story of sexism. So what I um, try to write about in my books and talk to kids about and everyone else is that we are not different. We are uh, very, very much alike. And uh, we have to, uh, this, the same rules should apply to everyone. Well, Uvash is completely right. We are on the edge of our seats here, um, <laughs> which is both because of the urgency of our topics, but also because of how uncomfortable we are. Um, so, in a sense, the project that is most um, exercising my mind at the moment, so I'm a professor of history, I work in a university, I write books of long, big books of history that essentially write women back into Australian nationalist narratives that have been taught to kids in school, taught to me in school, taught to my kids in school, but have always been taught as if men were the only participants in those events. So our most nation building, nation changing, um, historical events that are considered part of our national identity and uh, that they have been gendered male, those stories. So 
my books and my research as an academic has gone to reinserting the women who are actually there in the stories, writing them in from the ground up through archives. But where I'm currently kind of um, putting a lot of my energy and efforts is into the interface between academia and activism. And in particular, I've been running a campaign um, called A Monument of One's Own that is addressing the lack of statues of women. And where this fits with what Uvashi is talking about is because I think this is one of the kind of silent areas of patriarchy and the ways in which women uh, uh, internalise a sense of discomfort or that we have to put up with living in cities that weren't built for us and weren't built about us because we don't see representations of ourselves around us. So in Australia at the moment, 3% of statues are of women. There are more statues of animals than there are of women. Now this is a global issue. You'll find the same in the streets of London and New York and you know the first statue of, of um, a real named historical women just went up in Central Park a couple of years ago. And of course that's different from statues of nymphs or um, queens. I mean they're real named women. There are, And we have lots of statues of Queen Victoria and um, in, in Australia, um, but non-allegorical women, women who have actually done something, who can be celebrated. Um, and and are I, wearing clothes. And are wearing clothes, yes. yes. There was a statue of Mary Wollstonecraft that was unveiled um, uh, very recently. And, and Mary, um, the only thing that made the statue of Mary different from a lot of other uh, statues of naked women was that she was portrayed with a big um, patch of pubic hair. Um, but she still looks like, you know, she's a naked woman. And Mary Wollstonecraft, of course, was an incredible political philosopher of the 18th century. Um, so this campaign has been to address the, the, the gender gap in statuary. Uh, and, and this is an act of commemorative justice in, in a way. And people say, well, what difference can a statue make? And particularly because statuary, um, you know, marble, brass, whatever it's going to be made out of, is really a relic of 19th century colonialism and, uh, it's a, and has been used as a, t a tool of colonialism and a tool of imperialism, particularly in a country like Australia, um, it used to dispossess and reclaim a land for the British in, in a settler society. But I think that these things are, are really subtly important, like the architecture that we sit in, that our public infrastructure um, and, our, and um, the public architecture, the way that we read the cities that we walk down. If little girls and little boys can't see s s women on pedestals, essentially, we know how to read the power that's inherent in a statue on a plinth. We say, we don't, might not know who the person is, but we know they've done something important and we know they were a figure of credibility. And because there are no representations of anything that women have done in the past, it just reinforces that idea that women weren't there, they haven't done anything of any significance, they weren't part of nation building, and I think that limits what women feel like they can do in their present, in their, in their present and into the future, what roles they might play in building the future. So it's, it's ab about addressing that kind of, um, in, in, a, in a sense, invisible injustice. And making it visible, yeah. yes. Thank you for setting that out so beautifully. I do have to say, because I was involved in the campaign, that the memorial to Mary Wollstonecraft is intended to represent the birth of a movement, and it's not actually a representation of Wollstonecraft herself. Um, and I know that some people were upset on that, but I needed just to get that point in. But to return to the important point that you make about nation building, what um, I want to ask you, what, what, what can we learn from Australia? My most feminist memory is the Julia Gillard speech that okay. went viral, yes. um, but you've recently had the Indigenous Voices yes. referendum. Yes. What can we learn from Australian feminism? Well, what I would like people to understand about Australian feminism is that it is not as recent as Julia Gillard being the first Prime Minister of Australia, um, elected in 2010, and then making that mis the misogyny speech where she took on a man in Parliament, her op the opposition leader, and, and her speech went viral because she basically did what every woman wants to do to her um, husband, to her boss, to her father, which is just to go, uh-uh, I'm not taking that. It was I'm, pretty amazing. I'm calling you on that. 
Um, but actually, Australian feminism um, goes back to a century earlier. Uh, so the book that I'm supposed to have on sale here, but I don't actually think that it's made it from Australia, sorry, you can get it online, which is called You Daughters of Freedom, is about the fact that Australia became the first country in the world where women won full political equality with men. That is the right to vote and the right to stand for parliament. Australia at the turn of the 20th century was seen as being the global leader in democracy. We were the gold standard. Journalists, sociologists, political economists, everybody flocked to Australia to see what this grand exercise in gender equality was going to look like because the arguments against giving women the vote all over the world was that the sky was going to fall, that it was going to be the end of marriage, women wouldn't have children anymore, um, that it was going to rip the social fabric. So they wanted to see what was going on in Australia. Now I think the interesting thing about that is not only has the world forgotten that Australia was a world leader, but Australia has forgotten that as well. And so it's one of the reasons that I, I uh, when I went to write the book, actually what I was going to do was to show what those early feminists had done after Australia won the vote, which was to go out to Britain, work with the suffragettes, go to America. Australian women led those movements as well. But I realised that Australians didn't know their own history well enough and I had to actually spend the first third of the book telling that story. So I'd like, to rem I'd like people to remember from Australia that, um, that feminism and democracy is not a one-way street. You have, to com you have to constantly defend it, remember it, celebrate it, um, otherwise patriarchy is a very successful blanket in silencing and invisibling women's history. Yeah, so true. Um, and that brings me exactly to my next question yeah. for you, Marta, which is uh, how to think about backlash. We've, we all know what it is when we see it. It's been there since time immemorial. There's always a backlash. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how backlash manifests in your work? Well, um, uh, there are many similarities between uh, what you're talking about from Australia and Norway. Norway is um, usually talked about as one of the most equal societies in the world, and we were number four in getting the votes for women. Yeah. Uh, but uh, also Norwegians, even though I believe that equality is some kind of in our identity, we, we, we are very proud of these uh, <laughs> uh, things I'm talking about here, but, but we, we forget uh, very easily. And all my authorship has been about p uh, lifting those women who are, have uh, been forgotten. Also in the streets, I, I did make a book called uh, uh, Os Feminist, uh, Oslo, uh, uh, Feminist Guide to Oslo, where we write about all those women who have the streets and all those who doesn't have it and uh, try to make a difference. But uh, it's important because uh, in Norway we lean, we lean back and we leave very many things that, oh, feminine, we have done that. We are, we are finished and we can just relax and uh, whatever we have won, it will be won forever. And then now we see that that is not uh, the case. Uh, uh, early, uh, um, Norwegian, they don't identify with women in Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunately. We, we, we feel that, okay, that is another part uh, of the world. But when it suddenly things happen in the United States, when they lose the right to safe abortions, and uh, women in Poland, which is the biggest immigration group in Norway, they lose their rights, then suddenly it creeps uh, uh, closer and closer. So um, there, are sh there are shades of, the, you know, f from just forgetting or being passive to things, to, to actual pushback. Because yeah. one, one of the things that I wanted to, to invoke for discussion is there was a, a recent study, uh, it was most recently read in the Financial Times, but a global study that showed that whilst young women that tend globally are tending more towards progressive values, young men dramatically are becoming less progressive, the whole Andrew Tate online toxicity yeah. phenomenon, which we're seeing both in political leadership, which we're seeing in, you know, the, the big, in, in tech, in tech culture. Yeah. Um, how, how can we explain this? this and for, this is for anybody to jump yeah. in. Well, uh, I believe that um, guys, boys, men, uh, they are... Um, usually drawn uh, more to the uh, right-winged uh, politicians. And uh, to, uh, uh, when, peop when men uh, like macho pat patriarchal leaders, uh, as we see right now, like Putin, like uh, Orban, like Erdogan and uh, Bolsonaro and Trump, and also these uh, internet uh, insults, they uh, try to appeal to a certain thing in men, uh, which uh, is maybe uh, that they feel that they have lost something 
something, uh, something that they were entitled to, something that they, maybe they, their father had. That means, uh, uh, for example, full control over the women in the house. And uh, so they uh, are targeted by this uh, political uh, wave. And uh, uh, luckily, in many, many men, they uh, are very modern and uh, liberal and don't uh, fall for this. But unfortunately, and especially when times are uh, like a bit scary, as uh, it's right now, people become, uh, tend to become more nationalistic and uh, they uh, tend to uh, uh, be more um, uh, to, to obey, obey authorities, like uh, to look up to these very strong men. And so it's a very scary time at, uh, at the moment, I yeah. believe. I think a lot of people are feeling that. Ovashi, I want to come to you and talk about protest and not just the right to protest, but different forms, um, all the way from Shaheen Bag to online protest and what, what uh, manifestations, how that's incarnated. Can you talk to that, please? Um, okay, you want to know, you want to talk about protests here in India and um, yeah, well I think protest for us has been very much part of uh, the ways in which women in this country have mobilized for change uh, and in the past some of the protests have been relatively, within quotes, successful. So for example, when I was growing up as a feminist in the 70s, uh, we were battling the state on uh, legislation to do with rape, to do with dowry, to do with violence against women, and so on and so forth. And those protests were heard by a state which was open, relatively open, because it functioned in a democracy and relatively open to all its citizens, including women, if we could raise our voices enough. And we did succeed in getting some of those changes. Uh, the situation has changed dramatically since then. And it hasn't changed only in the last so many years, but it has changed over several years because for all our states, all our governments, the question of security has become a big question. And the citizen, male, female, or the citizen generally, has become the state's enemy. It's like the state is at war with its citizens. You know, the JLF once had a debate, a closing debate, the state is at war with its citizens, and people were defending the position and not. And I think that's really something that uh, states across the world are um, doing, because the citizen has become the state's enemy, and therefore to be silenced and, and kept down. And there, um, the protest of the citizens becomes a direct threat to state power. And therefore, it's limited by saying you can only go up to a certain space, you can only demonstrate here. You know, when we were young feminists, we could go up to more or less the Houses of Parliament in Delhi. And then we would be parked there, thousands of us. And then 10 people, 10 women would take a delegation across to the Houses of Parliament. They could meet any minister and they could talk to them. And they would listen to them, whether they do anything or not. But at least it gave you the illusion of a dialogue with power. That illusion is completely shattered. Power doesn't care. You can sit in Shaheen Bagh and protest forever, but it doesn't matter. To, so that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is protests like Shaheen Bagh, which are women's protests, have a different, bring a different character to protest. They bring feminism, and in unknownness, or perhaps unrecognized feminism, they bring their children. The protest becomes the place where they cook. The protest is where they sing. The protest is in Shaheen Bagh, they set up a library. There was a community library that was functioning there. Students were being given their lessons. So, and, and those women who might be battling each other inside the home, because that's what patriarchy makes them do, are building solidarities on the street. So that also becomes really important. And I think we've seen a lot of that. So, I wouldn't despair about protests. I would say that it has had to change its tactics, and it has. Mm -hmm. And if I may just add two things. I know we're running out of time. To the point that Claire made about our cities and statuary, mm -hmm. I would say there are so many other things to add, and one of them is toilets. Yes. If you oh, look yeah. at our cities, mm -hmm. you know, do our cities have women's toilets? Mm -hmm. They don't. They have started, I'm talking about India, they've started to have them now. When I was growing up, there were no toilets. We used to have to hide by the side of the road if we wanted to go to the toilet. Or we used to have to drive, those of us who come from privilege, drive into luxury hotels to use their toilets over there. 
What strikes me also as really revealing is, we notice the lack of toilets because we feel the need, but the guys never ever noticed it. Mm. Because for them, they had the toilets and they had the road. They could stand their backs on the road and use it, you know? <laughs> so they never noticed that women did not have this. This is what comes from mm -hmm. privilege, really. Yeah. So there's yeah. so many things that we really need to address I over there. I can see you're, you're dying to jump I, back I, in. I, just a historical point, Australia might have been the first country in the world where women could stand for parliament and, um, and had the first woman who did stand for parliament in 1902, a woman called Vida Goldstein. But the Parliament House that was built and opened um, in 1922 didn't have toilets for women until the 1960s, yeah, I think I was. Can, I can believe yeah. it. And so women had been elected to Parliament by then, it took until the 1940s, but they didn't actually have a toilet, those two women who were members of Parliament, to go to. And, and so we're finding this not so much on our streets necessarily, but in other areas where women are starting to participate that have been pre previously seen as all male, male areas. And I'm particularly thinking of sporting clubs. There are a lot of areas of, of, of male-dominated sports that are now being played by girls. Australia is a sports-mad country that are now being played by girls and women. And the sporting clubs have had to completely change the internal architecture to put change rooms and toilets in yeah. for women there because yeah. it's just never been... Yeah. Um, and it's women who now are thinking of toilets for trans people. Yes, exactly. So we look at change yes. and we open ourselves out to yeah, it. Yes. But the guys didn't. Yeah, and and quite right too, quite right too. I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to come to you, the audience, and bring in your participation. Um, I wanted to just open out, uh, as, as we know from Mary Wollstonecraft, feminism and women's rights are in t an integral part of the the machinery, the architecture, if you like, of human rights. And um, it's, it's become increasingly hard to think about human rights whilst witnessing what's happening in Gaza. And so, of course, many governments who will be proud of their record with equal pay and parental leave are also quite happy to withdraw funding from the United Nations organization that delivers food to mothers, babies, children who are literally starving. Uh, no Norway being a notable exception, but certainly Britain and the US have withdrawn Australia. their funding, and Australia. So, well done, Norway. But can I ask you to respond as feminists to this astonishing crisis? <clears throat> Well, um, it was Simone de Beauvoir, she said that uh, never forget that a political, economical or religious crisis always will cause doubt on women's rights. And she said that in uh, 49 or something, but, and it's still true, and we saw it under COVID, uh, when there is a regression, when there is uh, the uh, economical crisis, uh, it will uh, hurt the poorest people first, of course, and uh, in many ways. Uh, countries it is the women so uh, it is important to see to to always wear the feminist glasses on everything yeah. that's happening because it will uh, have a different um, feel it, it will uh, uh, yeah, it's a lens. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, wearing yeah. my feminist yeah, glasses yeah, the feminist right glass. now. I never, I never take, take them, off. them off. No, it's very important. But um, uh, the, um, a, a positive thing <laughs> in all of this is that whenever uh, there is a crisis like this, when whenever people lose their rights, when it's, if it's a backlash, then feminists will rise because feminism is uh, going in waves. And we can see that when like uh, the, the United States feminist movement has never been as active as when Donald Trump came to power. Yeah, uh, but you, you hinted at this earlier though about feminism being fine, but not for certain identities. And yeah, I think yeah. that that must be what we're witnessing here yeah. in Gaza. Yeah. What in well, you talked about feminism, you know, perhaps, oh, yeah, it's fine in Poland, yeah, Polish, yeah, 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 but maybe not further afield. Like, there's yeah. a, there seems to be a sort of, uh, there's a, a, an othering. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, it, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that, that uh, you mentioned the, the voice to parliament earlier in Australia, which is... Um, uh, uh, which was a movement to change the constitution in Australia that led to a referendum last year to give our First Nations people a voice, um, a, led, a, a voice that was enshrined in our constitution, a voice to parliament, and that so this referendum... Is in, in indigenous Indigenous people. people, our First Nations people, um, who were disenfranchised until the 1960s and have um, all of the same problems that many 
um, First Nations people around the world have had. Um, and I just wanted to make the point that those women who won the vote for Australia and, and made Australia into that world leading country and we can now um, celebrate them and there's going to be a statue that's uh, of our, one of the leaders that's about to go up in Melbourne through our advocacy. Those women did not fight for the rights of First Nations women at the time. So those women um, had nothing to say on that issue. The very same piece of legislation, it was called the Franchise Act, that it was one of the first pieces of legislation the Australian nation um, passed in, in 1902. Um, that piece of legislation which gave women those world leading rights actively disenfranchised First Nations people, including women. And nobody fought for those, none of the women that we're now celebrating fought for those rights. So again, this is, you know, history is very instructive in showing us that we're not remaking this wheel, but we do have to be very, very careful to bring everybody along because there's no such thing as one-way liberation, but also no one's free until everyone's free. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The, the absolutely. feminism is very much a work in progress. Thank you for that. Ovashi, would you like to? Yeah, if I could come in. Um, um, I think um, you said it, Marta has said it, I want to just agree with what she was saying, that politics, of course, is what trumps everything, political interest, and your earlier question about, you know, men uh, veering more towards the right, I don't think that that's the case. I think it's much more that the model of masculinity that our leaders are perpetrating across the world, and that's what really is, uh, is also being played out in Gaza and the anti-Muslim sentiment. But in South Asia, South Asian feminists have been gathering together in acts of solidarity with Palestinian feminists, and there has been a lot of work going on on the ground. And B, I want to just say to you that this is a session on many multiple feminisms, um, but feminism does not start with Mary Wollstonecraft. No. And Mary Wollstonecraft and many of the women who fought for the vote supported the colonial empire and supported empire in India against their Indian sisters. So I think when we talk of feminisms, I think it is really important to talk of this side of the globe and women this side of the globe. And I want to direct you to the Buddhist nuns in the 6th century BC. I want to direct you to a young Dalit woman in the 19th century who wrote against patriarchy. I want to direct you to a woman called Tarabai Shinde. I want to direct you to the hundreds of women who took part in the independence movement of this country. I know historian recognizes. That is where our feminism comes from. Yeah. It doesn't come from the West. It's, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely well said. And I think that's the perfect moment to, yeah. to open out. Thank you, Avashi. So I'm going to ask my microphone people to be super quick and speedy today because we don't want to lose time. So get your hands right up in the air. Uh, I want to hear from a young woman first, obviously. Yes, there's one right there. Hi. Yes, blue jumper, stand up, please. Yes. <laughs> she said I'm not too young. Oh, <laughs> younger than us. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, because it's a talk on many feminisms, I sometimes wonder whether the backlash to feminism comes from women struggling with balancing, let's say, how, you, how do you bring up an empowered little girl when you are not around and you're building your career? Or, you know, challenges of balancing your traditional roles with a, a career role, and feminism sometimes tends to be oppositional or arrogant to those conversations, and then it becomes an oppositional backlash. So in a conversation about many feminisms, do you think there needs to be more inclusivity with the you know, women who are struggling with how can I be a complete mother, how can I be a complete wife or daughter when I'm also being a feminist? I don't know if I'm putting Short my Short answer is yes. <laughs> All right, okay. I love that, yes. yes. Are you happy with that? Can we take another question, please? Here on the floor, yellow. Hi. Uh, uh, this great thing about toilets, I was looking for one and I could see only male toilets here. Oh. <laughs> Another thing, I, uh, I'm from the Indian Police Service and uh, we had uh, in 2001 the first national conference for women in police where in front of the Union Home Minister, the one of the main points we pointed out was that there weren't any women uh, toilets for women in police stations and even offices, the central district offices, which you will understand. And this is 24 and we have the same problem. But I just wanted to also say, when you were talking about many feminisms, and that's what we are talking about here, uh, so I see, especially uh, coming from this patriarchal male-dominated uh, field, you know, I also see 
that women, uh, like you very rightly pointed out, that at that point, the privileged women, or, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft... I'm going to push you to really, ask quickly, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you, so we don't so have much time. I will. So, the point is that there is also this need for women to hold on to some of the patriarchal power and just tell the patriarchy that we are not that much of another, right, while they're fighting for certain rights. Because if they disassociate completely with the patriarchy, okay. then they are completely negated and, you know, pushed out. And so what do you think about that? Okay, that was a statement. Um, does anyone want to respond? I mean, does that happen? I mean, do you feel that happen? Yes, I think it happens, but I think we have to deal with it because, you know, it's, feminism uh, is, as B pointed out, a work in progress. It's evolving and everybody's not on the same page. And I think just, yeah, it happens. OK, so, I can see a very waving person right at the back there. Yes, hand up. Please, can we get a microphone all the way to the back? Person in a dark blue T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Please make yourselves visible if you have a burning desire to talk to our panel. It's quite hard to spot some of you. Um, my question is, how do you view uh, the matriarchal philosophy or concepts fitting in with the terms of feminism? I don't understand. How do we view matriarchal... Matri the, matriarchy. the matriarchy. So the matriarchy is the opposite of the yeah. patriarchy, which is how women hold... Um, yeah. you know, power in cultural, social, economic spheres. Understood. What's the question? Sorry. How do you view the matriarchy as a concept within feminism? Okay. Uh, can I... Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I would you. say that the matriarchy has almost never, ever existed anywhere. And it's not, it's not a goal for feminists to, uh, to have a matriarchy. Oh, uh, uh, that, well, uh, if, if, if we understand the words correctly, so uh, a matriarchy will mean a place where women are in power, then uh, that's not what our goal. There's a brilliant, I'm really sorry, I, I, there's a very exciting book called The Patriarchs by Angela Saini, who wrote about yeah, matri matriarchal... I was supposed yeah, to be yeah, interviewing yeah, yeah. her, and unfortunately she's not matri here. local and matriarchal, um, and it's just a fascinating account. The patri patriarchy hasn't always been here and isn't inevitable. And um, do you want to take uh, that the, on? I, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable speaking about this. If I was in Australia, I probably wouldn't. But because I'm the Australian representative here, I will. That in our First Nations culture, um, matriarchal power systems are very much in place. So indigenous culture, uh, Australia has the oldest living culture in the world, 60,000 years of human occupation of the continent. And in Australian indigenous culture has a very strong matriarchal system. And there are many... Um, women now, First Nations women, who, uh, who don't call themselves feminists because they say that feminism does not in any way understand matriarchy and does not see mm. that if you embrace indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous political and power systems that matriarchy lives within it. So they won't identify as feminists because they think that feminism comes from a basis that only sees patriarchy in play. Uh, okay. Yeah, and this, I cannot this, recommend... This, this, uh, um, it, it's not, not the discussion in Norway. So because we, we have we, we feel that the, the both words means that someone has power over the other. So it's not uh, it's not discussed uh, at all. But I understand that it's uh, and could, a different could story try. here. And we could give it a try. It might be fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Hey, the night is young. What are we waiting for? <laughs> But I must give a shout out for Angela Saini's work. It's quite exceptional and very, very interesting. I know. Um, yes, on the front. Yeah, I've not seen the question uh, very well, but what I'm trying to say is that in India, we are having now this concept of capitalism <coughs> and market-free economy. We are going ahead with that. And um, whenever there is any conversation regarding uh, feminism has its roots in socialism, but the moment it comes to ideology, people are divided. So how hopeful are you of the solidarities that we can build? Because Abhi Purushottam Ram chal raha hai, Ram Sita ka bhi concept hata diya hai, religion mein se bhi. And then we want to go down to the very, I'm so sorry, I'm taking time. So, and then, so in my college also, if I say that we should be paid more, everybody is going to say that, ha, we should be paid more. But if I'm going to say that, welfareism hona chahiye, you know, we should have these policies, this is a good ideology. If we read more into it, people start getting divided. So can feminism A be apolitical <coughs> for getting to that goal and building solidarity? 
B, uh, can feminism and capitalism coexist? Hmm. Big question. <laughs> Whoever you are, you definitely deserve to be paid more. Yes. <laughs> I just want, um, uh, Ledu Vashi, you take that mostly. I just want to say one thing on that score is that first wave feminism was very much based on the idea that socialism and feminism were going to work together to end not only inequality in the gender sphere but inequality in the economic sphere and that ending poverty and particularly women's poverty around the world was part of that project and it's really important to remember and here's one of the things that we tend to forget as well International Women's Day which is now celebrated around the world as a time to, um, to, to celebrate women's achievements started as International, women's, International Working Women's Day and it was very much came out of um, socialism and that has been dropped and basically since the 1970s capitalism has co-opted International Women's Day. Okay, yeah. we've got time for one more question and it's yeah. the lime green question right here in the middle. It's our last, oh, I'm so Thank sorry, we, we're going to be thrown off. Okay. By Ovashi, please. Um, and then we'll come to you, but we've got to all be super say, quick. I would just say you have to ask a different question. Uh, not whether feminism can be divisive, anything can be. Ask yourself why a male and female who are born with exactly the same biological features except what hangs between the legs, what does that have to do with flying a plane or doing something else? Uh, so ask yourself why that inequality and you'll have your answer. Thank you. And okay. your last question briefly. Yeah, thank you. My question is that um, when women get elected as heads of villages, which we see in India as sarpanches, but we know that they are just a proxy for the men, um, or you can be a Dalit woman who's elected to the highest uh, post in the country, but then you're conveniently uh, you know, allowed to come to certain spaces or not allowed to come to certain spaces, not allowed uh, you know, when the country's parliament uh, is being opened or the biggest Ram Mandir is being opened. My question is to everyone, Urvishi to you, but to everyone saying, how do the many feminisms on stage view that sort of a moment and that sort of a dichotomy? Mm. Mm. What was it that it's... Um, uh, can I answer? I've understood yes. what she's asking. I can't respond to how many feminisms see that, and I think everybody might see it differently. The question was, when, you, when a woman is elected and comes to power, um, but when she comes from a marginalized community, that power is restricted as it is, for example, for a Dalit woman, that she's not allowed to access X and Y places. So the caste travels with her, even though she has power, and how do feminists view that? That was the question. So in a sense, as I said, I can't respond for all feminists. Uh, but what I can say is, yes, that is a, not a question for feminism, in the sense that feminism is not responsible for her caste traveling with her, or for the inequality that she carries. It's, there are many other things that are responsible for that, and we have to address all of those. Nonetheless, the fact that a Dalit woman may be in power through elected, uh, in an elected way like Maya, uh, Maya Rani was or whatever. So I think it is uh, very important for hundreds and thousands of young women to see that person there because it is inspirational and it puts forward for you a realm of possibility, uh, a way in which your dream can, if it can become a reality for her, maybe it can become a reality for me. So it doesn't solve the problem, but I think it's not unimportant. I'm going to have to say um, I'm so sorry to all the people whose questions we can't answer. I wish we could stay for a gigantic feminist festival that lasted all week. Yes. There is more than enough. There are so many questions. Yeah, yeah. There's so Next many year. places. I know. I just There's so much we could have got to, but I want to thank my brilliant panel. I loved your quote, freedom is not a cake. Let's, the, yeah. you know, the more you share, the more you get. And I'm going to close with the words of Audrey Lord. Of course, I am not free while any woman is unfree. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank Come you. and buy Thank you so much.